The Subcommittee on Space will now come to order. And without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses uh, of the Subcommittee at any time. Welcome uh, to today's hearing entitled In Space Propulsion, Strategic Choices and Options. I would now like to recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. We are on the cusp of a giant leap in space transportation technology. Advances in in-space propulsion systems hold the promise of radically altering space exploration. Breakthroughs will allow for faster travel, larger payloads, and greater efficiency. All of this will allow humanity to access the very farthest reaches of the solar system. This is clearly a subject that excites the imagination. NASA has led the way in developing in-space propulsion since its inception. The Space Electric Rocket Test, or CERT-1, as well as the Deep Space One, DS-1, and DAWN missions laid out the foundation of electric propulsion. The Nuclear Engine for Rocket Vehicle Applications Program, or NERVA, demonstrated the viability of, thermal, of nuclear thermal propulsion. These investments have ensured U.S. leadership in in-space propulsion which is very important for not only civil space missions, but also national security missions and commercial applications. Commercial in-space propulsion systems operating at kilowatts of power are a relatively mature technology today. In 2015, Boeing began offering the first all-electric commercial satellites. Because of these successes, we stand on the threshold of a new era one in which in-space propulsion and, and power systems could grow uh, to a scale and sophistication that would support human spaceflight and exploration. NASA is currently developing in-space power and propulsion systems that are, that are an order of magnitude more powerful than modern commercial systems. Originally developed for the canceled asteroid retrieval mission, this system will now be appropriately incorporated into NASA's exploration architecture and may be used on NASA's Deep Space Gateway. Similarly, developing this technology has taught us valuable lessons that will inform the next generation of in-space propulsion, which will send humans on to Mars. NASA's Human Exploration Mission Directorate is uh, supporting research on three new in-space propulsion technologies. These systems operate at hundreds of kilowatts of power, which is another 10 times more powerful than the systems under development for use around the moon, and could be used on a deep space transport system for missions to Mars and even beyond. The next generation in-space propulsion technologies under development by three of today's witnesses will be critical to ensuring that the exploration of Mars is possible, sustainable, and affordable. I hope that their testimony can help the committee to better understand the unique mission options that each technology will offer. As important as these developments are for the journey to Mars, the most exciting payoffs may come from the ability to develop these new engines even further. As discussed in NASA's technology roadmaps, scaling up the power levels another order of magnitude and building systems that will operate with thousands of kilowatts of power will significantly transform how humanity explores the solar system. These systems could even put the outer planets within reach of human explorers. To be clear, these developments are not simply about human spaceflight. Rather, it is an across-the-board change in technology on par with the development and the jump from sailing vessels to steam-powered ships. That long-term vision is still quite a ways off and will require further work, but the promise is utterly exciting. Smart investments, focused exploration goals, and constancy of purpose will maintain U.S. leadership and not only in space propulsion, but also space exploration more broadly. Our witnesses today that can help us better understand how all of these efforts fit together. I look forward to hearing about how in-space propulsion can expand our reach. Advancements in these technologies will literally open up a universe of possibilities. And I would now like to recognize a ranking member, the gentleman from California, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I? Yeah, please. Yeah. 
I, I, I'm about to forget our uh, a ranking member of the full committee. Okay, all right, sorry about that. All right, go ahead, Mr. Barra. Go ahead. Although before I um, read my opening statement, I'd, I'm told that there's a group of um, from the Society of Physics students here today. And just want to recognize those um, students that are here in the audience because they're interning in a variety of places, including our own House Science, Space, and Technology Committee. And you guys represent the future, and that's why we do what, what we do. So if you could stand up for a quick second so we could recognize all of you. And you know, I'd like my fellow. Well, thank you for being here. So, um, you know, Mr. Chairman, I think this is a, a very timely topic, and I'm looking across at this um, distinguished panel. It may take us a while to get through all of, all of your statements, but um, I think we're going to be well educated. Um, you know, chemical propulsion remains a critical part of today's human exploration program. Um, the two rocket boosters on NASA's um, space launch system use a solid chemical pr propellant, and SLS's RS-25 core stage rockets utilize liquid chemical propellant. However, relying solely on chemical propulsion for deep space travel would result in spacecraft having to carry large amounts of propellant, possibly requiring multiple launches even before a mission can be initiated. That's why many experts believe that NASA will need advanced propulsion systems to power the agency's future robotic and manned spacecraft. NASA is currently using non-chemical in-space propulsion in the form of electric propulsion. Electric propulsion is a continuous, low-thrust process and has been used by a few NASA robotic spacecraft, such as the Dawn probe, which has investigated the asteroid Vesta and is now orbiting Ceres. Um, the Department of Defense space vehicles and commercial satellites also make the use of solar electric power, but primarily for orbit, raising, and repositioning. For example, each advanced um, extremely high-frequency space vehicle, which provides critical um, global communications to our warfighters, use solar electric propulsion subsystems. Another type of in-space propulsion enabled through the use of nuclear reactors was studied to a limited extent in the 1960s. However, engineers found that the amount of shielding needed to protect crew from the dangerous effects of prolonged exposure to radiation generated by the nuclear reactor, as well as other technical difficulties, were challenges that were hard to overcome at that time. Now that we're planning um, on extended human travel into space, research into all forms of advanced propulsion technologies, including nuclear fission, is likely to intensify in the years ahead. It's critical that we find ways to reduce the time crew is exposed to galactic cosmic rays and other dangerous deep space radiation. Significantly reducing mission duration times can only be achieved through advanced in-space propulsion. As NASA continues to develop our plans on how to send humans to Mars and return them safely to Earth, now is a good time to examine the present and future options for in-space propulsion. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about different propulsion technologies and the unique characteristics that make them best suited to particular missions in space. Thank you, and I yield back. Absolutely. Sorry about the confusion. Now, now uh, the ranking member. Thank you very much. Let me say good morning to everyone and welcome our witnesses, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss in space propulsion with a wide range of government, academic, and industry experts. Uh, in space propulsion will be a critical enabler to our future missions, especially those involving human exploration uh, beyond Earth orbit. And I'm delighted that all of the young people of the future are here, and I hope that I see the enthusiasm as we have experienced in the past. Uh, it is important that this subcommittee assess the state of research and development related to in-space propulsion technologies, which NASA, the National Academies, the NASA Advisory Council, all consider a priority. Not only is this technology important for NASA and our space program, but it would also have benefits for the commercial sector which already uses electric propulsion for maintaining commercial satellite positioning. 
Mr. Chairman, I look forward to this hearing from my witnesses and about the range and types of in-space propulsion technologies being studied and the progress of the research and development in the, into each. When we consider progress, we also need to understand whether sufficient resources are being invested to make sure that the technologies will be ready when NASA needs them. It is important to note that the budget for NASA Space Technology Mission Directorate, which includes work on in-space propulsion, has been relatively flat. Can we achieve the milestones for the needed technology development on a flat budget? Mr. Chairman, our investments in research and development of enabling technologies such as in-space propulsion are our seed corn for achieving our goals for space exploration. It is our job to ensure that what we make and what we do and whether we make the needed investments will yield us the kind of results we seek. I thank you and yield back. Thank you. Uh, let me introduce our very distinguished uh, panel of witnesses today. Um, the first one I'd like to introduce is uh, Mr. W Bill Gerstenmeyer, uh, Associate Administrator of Human Exploration and Operations Directorate at NASA. Mr. Gerstenmeyer provides strategic direction for all aspects of NASA's human exploration of space and cross-agency space support functions including programmatic direction for the operation and utilization of the International Space Station. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Aeronautical Engineering from Purdue University, a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Toledo. Well, welcome. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Stephen Jerzyk, our second witness today, Associate Administrator of the Space Technology Mission Directorate at NASA. As associate administrator, he manages and executes the space technology programs, focusing on infusion into the agency's exploration and science mission needs, proving the capabilities needed by the greater aerospace community, and developing the nation's innovation economy. Mr. Jerzyk is a graduate of the University of Virginia, where he received a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering. We welcome you. Third witness today is uh, Dr. Uh, Mitchell Walker. Um, he is chairman of the Electric Propulsion Technical Committee of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Dr. Walker is also a professor of aerospace engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology, where he directs the High Power Electric Propulsion Laboratory. From 2011 to 2012, Dr. Walker served on the National Research Council Aeronautics and Space Engineering Board for the Air Force Reusable Booster System Study. His research interests include both experimental and theoretical studies of advanced plasma propulsion uh, concepts for spacecraft and fundamental plasma, uh, plasma physics. He also conducts research on Hall effect thrusters, gridded ion engines, diagnostics for plasma interrogation and thruster characteriz characterization, and several other aspects of electric propulsion. He received his PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Michigan, where he specialized in experimental plasma physics and advanced space propulsion. We welcome you, Dr. Walker. And fourthly uh, is Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz, uh, as CEO, founder and CEO of Ad Astra Rocket Company. Uh, Dr. Chang Diaz has flown a record seven space missions, logging over 1,600 hours in space, including 19 hours on three separate spacewalks. In 1994, he founded and directed the Advanced Space Propulsion Laboratory at the Johnson Space Center, where he continued developing propulsion technology. Prior to founding Ad Astra, Dr. Chang Diaz uh, joined the technical staff of the Charles Stark Draper Laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he conducted research and fusion. He earned a, a Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Connecticut and his PhD from MIT. We welcome you, Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz. Fourth, we have Mr. Joe Cassidy. Uh, excuse me, fifth is Mr. Joe Cassidy, Executive Director for Space of Washington Operations for Aerojet Rocketdyne. Mr. Cassidy has 33 years of experience in propulsion as well as mission and systems analysis. 
Uh, this includes flight projects for both the Air Force and NASA. He is also the Vice President of the Electric Rocket Propulsion Society. Mr. Cassidy earned a Bachelor's of Science and a Master's of Science in Aeronautics and Astronautics from Purdue University. He also received a Graduate Certificate of Systems Engineering from George Washington University. We welcome you. Our sixth witness today is Dr. Anthony Panacotti, uh, Director of Propulsion Research at MSNW. Dr. Panacotti previously worked at the Air Force Research Laboratory at Edwards Air Force Base, where he reviewed and investigated a range of advanced propulsion concepts. In 2011, he joined MSNW to work on a variety of fusion, propulsion, and plasma concepts, and is now the principal investigator for their Next Step propulsion program. He earned his PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Southern California, where he designed, built, and tested an experimental high-efficiency electrothermal ab ablative pulsed plasma thruster, it's a mouthful, called a capillary discharge. I now recognize Mr. Gerstenmeyer for five minutes to present his testimony. Thank you very much, and members of the committee for uh, the opportunity to be here to discuss in-space propulsion. Propulsion is a critical element of any human exploration plan or architecture. We need to further develop the ability to move humans and cargo in space to expand human presence into the solar system. Electric propulsion can be a key enabler to successful missions and activities beyond the Earth-Moon system. It offers significant advantages over other forms of propulsion, most notably efficiency. Electric propulsion can offer the ability to move large masses through space with minimum fuel usage. The other advantages are the fuel is storable, does not boil off, can, and can be easily resupplied. However, the thrust level of current electric propulsion systems is typically low, and it requires a significant amount of time to move the spacecraft in space. Even for habitats in the vicinity of the moon, we are planning to use 12 and a half kilowatt electric thrusters, which is about five kilowatts or 40% higher thrust than typical thrusters used today. This disadvantage of uh, long times is substantial when we're considering transporting, transporting crew. We prefer to transport crew as fast as possible to avoid prolonged exposure to microgravity and high radiation conditions. We anticipate the early systems for sending crew beyond the Earth-Moon system will use a combination of chemical and much higher thrust level electric propulsion systems, possibly 50 to 100 kilowatts or greater. The future systems we are investigating would increase thrust level and shorten transit time while still maintaining the high efficiency. We are looking at increasing thrust levels by factors of 10. These systems are at lower technology readiness levels, but offer the promise for new technologies in the future. We have partnered with American industry through our next step broad agency announcement, including some of the panelists here today, to investigate and advance the capabilities of these emerging systems. Looking at a variety of systems in the early stage of development is important. Maturing technologies and demonstrating system performance through ground testing prior to committing to utilizing them in operational systems and beginning a major systems development activity helps constrain program cost and schedule risks. NASA and other R&D organizations have learned that starting systems development activities prematurely can lead to significant technical challenges and unacceptable cost and schedule growth. The broad agency announcement process allows us to investigate the specifics of systems design before committing the technologies into an actual spacecraft or system. As we prepare for missions in the vicinity of the moon and ultimately Mars, electric propulsion will be a key enabling technology. We will build off of the work done in support of the asteroid redirect mission. Our ARM concept work showed the tremendous benefits of electric propulsion for moving large masses in space, which transformed our approach for human exploration in deep space. The asteroid redirect mission also helped us to understand the advantages of departing the Earth-Moon system for Mars for, from the vicinity of the moon rather than from Earth orbit. And we believe using electric propulsion to pre-position key large elements will be necessary for human Mars class missions. Electric propulsion will play a key role in emerging concepts such as crew tended habitation modules in the vicinity of the moon. With advanced, electric propulsion, with advanced electric propulsion, we will have the ability to move habitat systems to various orbits around the moon. We can support crewed science operations from the module in various uh, lunar orbits. 
equatorial halo orbits or even an orbit around uh, Lagrangian point two on the far side of the moon. This far side lunar orbit location would allow telerobotic operations from crews on board the habitat module on the far side of the moon, something we have, on the region of the moon we have never explored. The module is not stuck in one place around the moon. It can be moved to various locations thanks to electric propulsion. As we look to electric propulsion for crew tended habitation systems around the moon, we will look for synergies with the commercial communications satellite industry and take advantage of electric spacecraft development in that market. Combining these capabilities with higher power electric propulsion systems being developed by NASA's uh, Space Technology Mission Directorate will enable both the advance of U.S. industrial capabilities and the creation of the in-space infrastructure we need in the lunar vicinity to further the nation's space exploration goals. Electric propulsion and advanced propulsion systems will be a key enabler for human exploration systems of the future. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this topic with the committee, and I look forward to your questions. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Gerstenmeyer. <clears throat> now I recognize uh, Mr. Jerzyk for five minutes to present his testimony. Chairman Babin, Ranking Member Barra, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss NASA's in-space propulsion research and development activities with a focus on the agency's efforts in space technology. NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate, STMD, programs are aimed at key research and technology challenges that will enable more ambitious missions in the future and create a new space economy. The STMD is developing new capabilities for in-space propulsion, including higher performing chemical propulsion, high power electrical propulsion, and nuclear thermal propulsion. The goal is to demonstrate these new capabilities in the near term to transition them into robotic and human missions in the next decade. So electrical propulsion technology has long been a priority technology investment by STMD, and SEP capabilities have been of great interest to NASA, other government agency organizations, and industry for many years. The focus of the current SCP technology project has been on increasing the solar power generation capability of spacecraft and development of advanced thrusters that are about two and a half times the power level of existing thrusters with significant increases in operational lifetime. Recently, NASA has demonstrated full performance of a high power electric propulsion thruster system with more than 2,500 total hours of testing with no degradation in system performance. The agency subsequently awarded a contract to Aerojet Rocketdyne for development and delivery of engineering units of a 12.5 kilowatt thruster system, system by the end of 2018. The activities to advance solar power generation capability culminated in the successful development of advanced solar arrays by our industry partners, deployable space systems, and orbital ATK that are two times lighter and use four times less stowed volume for the same amount of electricity produced as compared to today's commercially available solar arrays. NASA recently completed an Air Force Research Lab sponsored test of the deployable space systems solar ray technology on the ISS. The current SCP system being developed for demonstration class mission will provide between 300 and 500 kilowatts of power. The initial deep space transport capability for crewed missions beyond the Earth Moon system requires approximately 300 kilowatt system. STMD intends to continue advancing thruster technology, increasing the power level up to 10 times current thruster systems to enable this capability. The Solar Electric Propulsion Project illustrates the strength of, multi of a multi-application approach to technology development. Other government agencies and the commercial space sector have shown interest in utilizing the component technologies, especially the deployable solar arrays at 5 kilowatts to 30 kilowatt power levels. Commercial satellite firms will soon use these arrays with their lower weight and improved packaging efficiency to lower the cost of future communication satellites. STMD is also currently in the second year of a three-year effort to develop a safe and affordable nuclear thermal propulsion system. This effort is focused on addressing the most significant challenges in developing an NTP system, including reducing the risk and cost of the reactor system, enabling long-term storage of liquid hydrogen, the working fluid for NTP, and developing an approach for safe ground testing of, of the system. The agency will use the results of these activities to determine the feasibility and cost of advancing NTP by development and testing of a ground demonstration system. Although NASA does not expect to require advanced propulsion technologies such as NTP in the initial crewed missions to the Mars system, NDP can reduce trip times to Mars significantly. Finally, STMD will continue to advance power systems technologies to enable high-performing electric propulsion systems, including both, including both solar and nuclear-based power generation. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your support and that of this committee. I would be pleased to respond to any of your questions that you or the other members have. Thank you, Mr. Jersey. I'd now like to recognize Dr. Walker for five minutes. Thank you. You might want to turn on your 
Speaker, there you go. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Barra, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to share my views on strategic investments in America's in-space propulsion technology program. I've been fortunate to serve on the faculty of the Daniel Guggenheim School of Aerospace Engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology since 2005. It gives me great pride to work closely with undergraduate and graduate students as they develop into the space propulsion engineers and scientists of our nation's future. I presently serve as the vice chair of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics Technical Committee an associate editor of the Journal of Spacecraft and Rockets, and the general chair of the 2017 International Electric Propulsion Conference. I'm here today as an individual, and the views I express are mine alone. Electric propulsion is the acceleration of propellant with electrical energy to generate thrust for spacecraft. Hall effect thrusters and gridded ion engines are successful examples of electric propulsion used in commercial, defense, and civil applications. Electric propulsion offers a significant advantage over chemical propulsion because the exhaust velocity is not limited by the amount of energy released from the chemical bonds of the propellant. Compared to chemical propulsion, the electrical approach enhances the efficiency of the propulsion system by more than an order of magnitude and leads to significant reductions in propellant mass. Typically, electric propulsion devices do not have large thrust because of the limited spacecraft power available. NASA has been a leader in the development and flight of electric propulsion technology. NASA flew its first electric propulsion device in 1964. In 1998, the NSTAR ion propulsion system on NASA's Deep Space One spacecraft flew. The NSTAR ion engine enabled a trip that included flybys of an asteroid and a comet. In 2007, NASA launched the Dawn spacecraft that also uses NSTAR ion engines as primary propulsion. To date, Dawn has orbited both Ceres and Vesta. Scientists will continue to embrace the unique capabilities of electric propulsion to explore our solar system. Our world has gradually shifted to a space-based infrastructure that includes GPS, satellite radio, satellite TV, DOD communications, weather monitoring systems, and we stand in the midst of a paradigm shift in the requirements for these spacecraft from traditional chemical propulsion to electric propulsion. This shift is a result of a dramatic increase in available satellite electrical power. During the last 20 years, investments in solar array technology have increased geosynchronous satellite power from one kilowatt to over 25 kilowatts. In 2015, this trend culminated in the launch of Boeing's first all-electric spacecraft. All-electric satellites use electric propulsion as a primary propulsion and to provide 15 years of station keeping on orbit. The enormous propellant mass savings achieved with electric propulsion allows two all-electric satellites to launch on one smaller, less expensive launch vehicle. Current projections show that 50 to 75 percent of all future geostationary spacecraft will use electric propulsion. All electric spacecraft coupled with low cost launch vehicles enabled our nation to recapture the global launch vehicle market for commercial satellites. To remain economically competitive with this success, all launch vehicle providers are forced to upgrade their systems. In addition, Europe and Russia continue significant investments in electric propulsion. India and China each launched their first electrically propelled geostationary satellite this year. Japan is scheduled to launch its first all-electric commercial satellite in 2021. Electric propulsion is recognized as a competitive factor in the technology portfolios of these countries. There are three activities that I strongly believe will bolster our nation's leading position in electric propulsion technology. First, investments are required in electric propulsion technology across the spectrum of expected time to return on invest investment. Second, the nation must invest in ground-based test facilities to develop and then fly the next generation of electric propulsion devices. Third, NASA must maintain a steady stream of investment in university research programs to ensure that the unique intellectual talent required to fly these systems is available when we are ready to execute on these ambitious missions. The role of electric propulsion in the exploration of our solar system, economy, and security will increase in the coming decades. Thus, investment in NASA's electric propulsion program helps maintain our leading position in space technology, aids the economic competitiveness of our nation, enhances our understanding of the physical world, and inspires current and future generations to pursue STEM careers. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Walker. I now like to recognize uh, Dr. Chang Diaz for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I am honored to be called to testify before you on this important topic for our nation and for our civilization. In securing our ability to travel in deep, in deep space safely and sustainably, we are also ensuring or helping to ensure the survival of our species. I, I believe that space travel actually beckons humanity 
a lot more today than it did 50 years ago. But we need to say, uh, secure a safe and robust and fast means of transportation. Going to the moon is one thing. Going to Mars is a completely different thing. So on the screen, I wanted to put, put up that uh, graphic representation of the um, in-space propulsion challenge before us. Despite decades of progress in, in many areas of space technology, the challenges of deep space transportation remain as clear and present as they were in the 1960s. Our transportation workhorse, the chemical rocket, has reached an exquisite level of refinement, but it has also reached its performance limit. That technology will not provide us with a sustainable path to deep space. It does not mean that we need to discard it. On the contrary, chemical rockets will continue to provide foundational launch and landing capabilities for the foreseeable future, and reducing their cost is a worthy goal. But once you're in space, the path to sustainable transportation lies in high-power electric propulsion. And by high power, I mean power levels of 100 kilowatts and up. 100 kilowatts, roughly, the power of a, a small car. 300 kilowatts is the, the power of an SUV, just to give you a, a sense for, for what these things mean. Each one of us in the Next Step program is due to demonstrate the efficient operation of our respective technologies at a power level of no less than 100 kilowatts for 100 continuous hours. These rockets will first be solar electric, and later, as we move outwards from the sun, they must transition to nuclear electric power. Ad Astra Rocket Company is an American corporation developing a uniquely American technology. We are based in Texas. Our flagship project is the Vasimir engine. It is an electric rocket that fits squarely within the high-powered niche as previously defined and can scale naturally to multi-megawatts. The Vasimir originated at MIT in the 1980s. The technology was transferred to NASA in the 1990s and privatized by the Ad Astra Rocket Company in 2005. The most advanced Vasimir engine is the VX200, which is a 200 kilowatt engine, which has executed more than 10,000 reliable and efficient firings at power levels of uh, 200 kilowatts and higher. Its performance uh, data has been well vetted by the science community and published in the top peer-reviewed journals of our industry. The technology readiness level of the Vasimir is now between four and five. The lion's share of this development has been achieved at Ad Astra Rocket Company with more than $30 million of private investment from US and international investors. In 2015, NASA became a partner and awarded us a three-year, three million per year next step contract to help bring the technology to TRL-5. We are halfway through this program and moving smartly to its successful completion in mid-2018. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, our nation, as we move to explore deep space with humans, we must be able to travel fast to reduce the debilitating effects of, of space on the human body, to reduce the burden of consumables, life support, to be less constrained by planetary alignments and tight launch windows, and to expand our capability to recover from unforeseen contingencies en route. In short, this is the problem punch list we need to still solve to give our astronauts a fighting chance in deep space. The development of high-power electric propulsion is critical to checking these boxes and to meeting our nation goals in space. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chang Diaz. Uh, now recognize Mr. Cassidy for five minutes for your testimony. Good morning. Chairman Babin, Ranking Member Barra, members of the committee, and your staff. I appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning to discuss how in-space propulsion will enable and enhance the nation's space exploration efforts together with the Space Launch System and the Orion. I'm going to summarize my remarks here, but I'd like to request that the written testimony be included in its entirety in the record. That's OK. Thank you, sir. On behalf of all Aerojet Rocketdyne employees across the country, I'd like to thank you and your committee here 
for the relentless work the members and staff have put forth to ensure that the nation space program is a success. Your commitment to exploration and discovery should be lauded. This is a time of excitement and inspiration within the space community and for that matter across the country and around the world. We are building today the systems necessary to get humankind back to deep space and on to Mars starting in the early 2020s with the Deep Space Gateway in lunar orbit. Just for a moment, I'd like to tell you a little bit about who we are. Aerojet Rocketdyne is a world leader in power and propulsion. We've supported the nation's defense, civil, and commercial space efforts for over 70 years. Among the accomplishments we take pride in are having launched every astronaut from US soil, landing seven spacecraft successfully on the surface of Mars, and sending spacecraft to visit every planet in the solar system. And I include Pluto in that because it was a planet at the time we launched that mission. Of particular relevance to this hearing, we've been pioneers in the application of electric propulsion since the 1980s. In fact, right now there are some 160 spacecraft orbiting the Earth flying our electric propulsion products of one type or another. As NASA looks to expand human presence in the solar system, development of efficient in-space transportation systems is critical. Solar Electric Propulsion, or SEP, is key to the sustainable architecture shown in the projected graphic by enabling efficient transfer of cargo, habitats, and payloads to deep space destinations in advance of astronaut arrival. Here's why that's important. Today, we can land one metric ton on the surface of Mars. In order to do these human missions, we need to land 80 metric tons of supply and equipment. Mars missions will also send humans much farther than ever before. This combination of heavier payloads and the need to travel over greater distances drives us to seek a solution that takes advantage of strategic logistics planning. An analogy to explain this approach is the way that military deployments are conducted today. First, the heavy equipment, supplies, and other logistical items are pre-deployed by large cargo ships and planes to the region. Then, once the equipment is in place, the troops follow by fast air transport. SEP systems are the equivalent to the cargo ship for deep space missions. These systems are now under development by NASA and Aerojet Rocketdyne to reduce the amount of propellant needed for these space missions by a factor of 10. This is important because it costs just as much to launch propellant as it does to launch scientific instruments or other mission critical equipment. With SEP, we can reduce the number of launches needed and thereby taxpayer cost to achieve the mission. We're well on our way to having efficient in-space transportation with SEP. We must continue to adequately fund these development and demonstration efforts. The primary challenge facing high power SEP development is the risk of losing focus as we go through the critical transition period from development to flight demonstration and subsequently operational use. This requires a stable budget and a constancy of purpose. Everything we do should be with the goal of landing humans on Mars in the 2030s. Currently, we're on a development path that will result in an SEP system capability in the 100 kilowatt to 200 kilowatt total power range. This is more than adequate for early outpost missions to Mars. As SEP is scaled up to several hundred kilowatts, another challenge we face is managing the power transfer from the solar arrays to the thrusters. To reduce transit times, it's important that power is transferred as efficiently as possible. Since commercial spacecraft power systems are designed to power payloads, and those are sized at 10 to 20 kilowatts, a power system from a traditional spacecraft cannot be adapted for a high power SEP cargo vehicle. We're currently working on three separate SEP system developments with NASA and details are provided in my written testimony. So finally, let me just say thank you and I look forward to answering your questions about our in-space propulsion activities. Thank you, Mr. Cassidy. I'd like to recognize Dr. Pancotti for five minutes. Chairman Babin. Chairman Babin, Ranking Member Barra, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on in-space propulsion in the United States. I thank the committee for its long-standing support of space exploration and plasma physics research in this country. I am pleased that the committee is considering such important topics. I would also like to thank the Air Force Research Laboratory, including the Office of Scientific Research, 
as well as the SBIR program, which initiated and developed FRC propulsion over the past decade. High power electric propulsion is a key technology for humanity's sustained presence in deep space. In order to build a permanent existence beyond the bounds of Earth, advanced in-space transport will need to break today's impulse and coast approach and advance to continuous direct burns to destinations in our solar system. For, a fit, for this approach to be effective, high specific impulse devices are needed. This metric ensures that a large fraction of the expensive masses we launch into orbit are payload and not just more propellant to get the job done. Considering that even the most conservative manned missions to Mars are predicted to require almost 100 metric tons to reach the planet's surface, the cost of this endeavor becomes unsustainable. The above argument for high specific impulse provides good testimony for all electric pulsion systems. While low power systems could effectively transport spacecraft almost any, anywhere in our solar system, it would take years or even decades. A trip from Earth to Mars with today's electric propulsion and the world's largest solar array on board the International Space Station would take over 10 years. These timescales do not lend themselves to a sustainable deep space architecture. To be truly a sustainable endeavor, high power is needed to deliver any significant amount of mass in a reasonable period of time. While all the technologies being presented here today address this fundamental issue of high specific impulse and to a varying degree high power, MSNW's 100 kilowatt FRC thruster supported by the NASA program has some key advantages. In addition to the aforementioned, FRC propulsion is very lightweight. And as we all know, lighter is faster. And for spacecraft, allow more payload on board. If humanities intend to explore, build, and ultimately inhabit far-reaching destinations, it will require propulsion systems that are very lightweight. Variable power is another area where FRC propulsion has strong advantages. In interplanetary missions that use solar energy have a large decrease in power as you travel further away from the sun. Because, FR3, because FRC thrusters are pulsed fixed energy devices, not fixed power devices, they can accommodate a large range of power inputs in a single design. This means that FRC thrusters can be validated in a cislunar space, and the exact same hardware can be applied to a Mars transfer mission. Another important benefit with regards to power is FRC's ability to scale up. The physics of this technology were born out of the fusion community that currently operate FRC devices at energy levels that would correspond to a, to a 70 megawatt thruster. Considering these origins, FRCs would be able to service the propulsion demands for several generations and expand deep space architecture to Mars and the ocean worlds beyond. The most unique characteristic of FRC propulsion is their ability to operate in a wide variety of propellants, including oxygen, which typically degrades vital components in other propulsion systems. FRC thrusters have been demonstrated on pure oxygen as well as carbon dioxide, a major component in Martian atmosphere. FRCs have also been formed on vaporized water, which is easily stored and available, may be available throughout our solar system. As part of MSNW's Next Step program, the FRC thruster will be operated on Martian atmosphere and methane. While this fact may have some benefit to traveling to Mars and beyond, the real advantages are when we return home. Whether that trip is to bring back explorers or sample materials, the ability to refuel at almost any planetary body within the solar system has huge advantages. The cost savings of this approach are significant, and NASA is already focused on this topic called in situ resource utilization. We cannot have the future we want tomorrow without investing in its technology today. This is no easy task when there are many expensive and pressing matters that require our attention at home. While many of those matters cannot be ignored, we must keep our eyes lifted to the horizons and invest in our future. While this task may be daunting and overwhelming, it happens one step at a time. To, by making strategic choices, the next step we take will put us on a path to the future that we all want. I applaud NASA and the US government for their commitment to space technology and exploration. And with your continued support, my colleagues and I can make the right next step for a better future for all of humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pancotti. Uh, fascinating testimony. I know we've, we've had even some more young folks come into the room 
Uh, it's great to see so many people here this morning to hear this, uh, this testimony. I'd also like to introduce uh, two interns that I've got uh, that are sitting over there, uh, both of them real small fellows. Y'all stand up for us, Bo Swanson and Jonathan Ladd. <laughs> we need a bigger office, I can tell you that. <laughs> anyway, we appreciate uh, all of you being here this morning, and thank you for this testimony. Um, I uh, want to thank the witnesses for your testimony, and I'd like to recognize myself for uh, five minutes of questions. Um, I'd like to direct this to the to Dr. Uh, uh, Chang Diaz and uh, Mr. Cassidy and Dr. Pancotti, because I'd like for you to kind of delve into it a little bit more, so for the benefit of all of us here, what capabilities? And I've had. Let me just say this: I've had the the privilege of uh, of touring and visiting two of you guys' uh, facilities, and uh, very very interesting. What capabilities does your specific technology have? that makes it unique. We'll start with you, Dr. Chang Diaz. For, um, for the Vasimer, there's, there's certain features that are unique. Um, one is that it can vary uh, the thrust and the specific impulse of the rocket, keeping the power the same. Is, is essentially the same thing that you do when you shift gears in a car. Right. And if you drive a car like a race car driver, you step on the gas and you never let go and all you do is shift gears. And so it, when you're climbing a steep hill, you would want more torque in your wheel, so you shift to higher thrust. And when you uh, are speeding in flat terrain, uh, such as interplanetary space, you would want to upshift to you know, fifth and sixth gear, and then you will have a, a higher specific impulse. Still the same power, maximum, because you pay dearly for the, for the power. And so it's important to have that feature. That's one. The other one, of course, is that when you're dealing with plasmas, you're talking about very hot uh, so substances, and you want to keep them off of the sur surrounding rocket casing. So um, uh, you want to have magnetic, magnetic uh, nozzles, magnetic pipes that guide the plasma. Um, the, the way you heat the plasma also is unique. We use electromagnetic waves. It's pretty much the same way you heat your coffee in a microwave oven. You don't touch it. You just launch these waves, and these waves wiggle the plasma, get it really hot. And we're talking about temperatures of the order of you know, two to three million degrees. So, so the, the, these are some of the features, and that gives you a great deal of capability to, um, uh, to, to open up in the technology. So just a summary. Mr. Cassidy. I think the unique feature of our approach on the Next Step program is that we're building upon what we've already flown. Um, our device that runs at 100 kilowatts is what we call a nested hall thruster, and there's some description of it in the written testimony, but just for the group here today, uh, we fly a 5 kilowatt hall thruster on the advanced DHF spacecraft now, as, as was mentioned earlier. Um, it has a single um, annular region where the plasma is generated. The nested hall thruster takes that, adds a second ring outside, and then even a third ring. And each of those rings, you're running essentially a, the hall discharge. So we're able to take what we've known today, that we fly today, and scale it up simply without making it that much physically larger. We can scale it up to the much higher power. The other part of it is I would really like to delve into the system aspects. Because we're doing that approach, we're able to also deal with the power processing issues that we've learned a lot of lessons on in our flight experience. And uh, not sure what's going on there. <laughs> That's, ignore that. Ignore it. OK, thank you. <laughs> um, so the other half of the system, the thrusters are obviously a very important part, and they're the visible part that we all see. But the other half of the system is the power, and, and Franklin referred to that. Um, we have to shepherd that power through very carefully because wasted power is uh, time to us. We need all the power we can get to keep that time down. So we're building, you know, building blocks that we've learned from our flight experience into modular designs that we can scale up uh, incrementally to these higher powers. And as Steve Jerzyk mentioned earlier, you know, we also are working now on the 12 and a half kilowatt hall thruster. It's another incremental step. 
So incrementalism is my, uh, is my, I guess, word that I would use. Thank you very much. And Dr. Pancotti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think in my testimony, I, I highlighted quite a bit about um, what we call ISRU, uh, Institute Resource Utilization. Uh, and for me, um, when we're looking long-term ter long towards sustainable uh, infrastructures in space to become a space-faring race um, or a, a multi-world species, um, advanced uh, capabilities that will allow us to use the resources of our solar system will become vital. Um, just like today, if you wanted to drive across our country, you wouldn't uh, fill up an 18-wheeler worth of gasoline to make it. You would stop along the way and refuel. Uh, and I feel like this is a very important aspect of building a sustainable infrastructure to be able to go to Mars, scoop up atmosphere, and use that to, to propel um, your spacecraft to the next destination or to return home. Um, ISRU has a large um, payoff for return missions um, and also uh, return missions from icy moons. So if we did want to go to far off destinations, asteroids or icy moon um, planets, we could take water, use that as propellant and return very large samples to Earth. Uh, the other aspect I think that is fairly unique about FRC propulsion is, is the power. Um, not only is it scalable over a very, very large range of powers, like I indicated, for many generations of propulsion systems to come, we can use the same technology, um, but also the ability to, to vary that power over a mission. Because it's fixed energy, we can optimize an impulse for an exact energy condition, and then by changing how often we fire it, we optimize it, or we, we can use it over a very, very large range of powers within a single design. Thank you very, very much. Now I'd like to recognize the uh, ranking member of our committee, uh, Mr. Barrow. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Babin. Now I'm, I'm a simple person. I'm a doctor, not a rocket scientist. Um, but if, if I'm thinking about this correctly, and you know, let's think about it in the context of um, travel to, to Mars just for, for s sake of, of concrete, we know the distance that we have to travel. Um, we know the safe amount of cosmic radiation that a human being could get exposed to you in terms of the, the, the time, potentially. I think just listening to the, the testimony, we can think about this in two different ways. If we're sending supplies that are non-organic, non-human beings, um, you, know, you can send that at one speed, um, perhaps using one type of propulsion system, but then if we are sending human beings, we've got to send them at a, a different speed, perhaps faster, but at less weight. Is that, am I thinking about this correctly? Um, you know, just a, as a, a doctor, you could also then think about, you know, as we're thinking about how to send them faster, you know, what kind of additional shielding potentially we could do to prolong the time that they could, could be exposed to cosmic radio. Is that, that's correct as well. So it's not an either or, it's, you know, perhaps, all of all of these propul propulsion um, technologies um, that we ought to be thinking about here, as well as you know, working with our scientists and the folks that are, that are looking at that. Um, you know, Dr. Panicotti, you also talked about taking water if we find planets with ice, and you know, there, there's some thought that you know, it, part of our travel back to the moon is potentially looking for ice in some of these deep craters that could. Um, that we could then turn into fuel and use the moon as, as a launch site. Is that correct? Or, yeah. yeah, that's correct. Um, Earth has a very deep gravity well, which means it's very expensive. That's why it costs so much to launch mass out of our gravity well. If we can find resources outside our gravity well or in smaller gravity wells that we can use, it will ultimately save us money. Okay, so, the, so for, for us, as we're thinking about it, explaining to, to our constituents and, and the public, when they say, well, we've already been to the moon, why would we want to go back to the moon? Run, one reason we would want to go back to the moon is that that is a potential secondary launch site. Is that, or, or not? Yes. Yes. OK. I, well, again, I, I, I'm using your expertise to make sure I'm educated so that when I'm out talking to constituents, and they ask these questions or talking to the to broader public, it's like, well, here's why this matters. Or if they say, well, why are you looking at solar propulsion or, or different technologies? Well, here's, here's why this matters. So, um, you, know, you know, kind of, you know, looking at the, the human element, maybe, um, you know, 
Mr. Gertzen Meyer, um, what is that, you know, just to, to kind of put it in context, what is that safe time for a human to, to be exposed at, you know, using current technology, if, again, thinking about travel to Mars? When we look at Mars today, basically with uh, chemical propulsion, the transit time to Mars is roughly about a year or so, and then a, a year return. That's right at the limit of the radiation uh, levels that the uh, human can tolerate. So we can, we might have to take a small wave or two of some of our radiation constraints, but we can basically make it with chemical propulsion. The big advantage here with the, the higher power electric propulsion is you can cut that time down and get more margin. And so the radiation exposure for our crews is dramatically less. So I think what's, what's interesting about this technology is it really opens up our way to do mission design the way you described. Um, we talked about the gravity well being tough to leave the Earth. Right. It's much nicer from the vicinity of the moon or a high elliptical orbit around the moon. Now we can station keep there with electric propulsion, then use these high energy power systems to transit the Earth-Moon system to these distant locations with, with uh, much higher speeds with the higher thrust levels. So this, this technology really opens up the ability we can do mission design to uh, essentially optimize the overall systems design such we minimize the exposure of the human to radiation in the microgravity environment. So we really should be thinking about multiple modes of, of propulsion. You know, one um, theory that someone was also suggesting was, you know, and correct me, these Lagrange points where, you know, things can, can sit stationary, potentially, for lack of a better way of describing it, having a gas station up there where, you know, having um, propellant up there, you break through gravity while you're able to go up there, refuel, and then go on. Is that just theoretical, or is that something that folks think about? I, th I think, uh, as Bill was just saying, some of the groups getting together now to study how we go, what this what this architecture ought to look like, and you saw a little bit of that in the graphic I put up. One of the thoughts is you could aggregate things out there in the lunar vicinity and then depart from there. And part of that aggregation, when I say aggregate, I mean bring different pieces of the eventual Mars spaceship to that point, and that could inc include fuel. So, uh, and then as, as uh, Anthony alluded to in his testimony, um, you know, as we get better at making fuel on other places where we're going, um, we don't have to, you know, use the gas station or bring everything from Earth. We'd like to, to use the, the things that we find when we get out there into the solar system, and perhaps we have a couple more nodes in the, in the overall subway system, if you want to consider it like that, going between Earth and Mars, where we can re refuel the systems. Great. Thank you. I'll yield back. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gerstenmeyer, what we seem to be talking about here I think could best be described as the concept of extensibility, uh, that technologies developed in the near future will be useful for future exploration as well, and extensibility prevents the development of dead-end capacities. Discuss with us for a moment how NASA ensures that its investments in in-space propulsion technologies have that ability. Again, I think, um, as you've kind of heard from this discussion, we're kind of investing in a variety of technologies, so we don't pick one technology to focus on solely. We do the, the broad agency announcements to go look at a variety of technologies. We test those on the ground. We make sure they show promise. We have this requirement for this 100 kilowatt system to run for 100 hours. That's a good proof of concept that can be done on the ground. Then when that's kind of behind us, we know the system is mature enough, then it can start be, being fielded into an operational system. And, and for example, the, the concept of the habitat around the moon, that uses a 12 and a half kilowatt uh, system that Steve and the, the Space Technology Mission Directors have been investing in. That's a step up from where we are with electric propulsion today and the Hall thruster regime, but that's an incremental step moving forward. So I think by taking these steps, but also investing in these far reaching technologies that are not yet, we're not sure what promise they have, that's also advantageous too. So we need to have that mixed investment philosophy of where we're looking at each one of these, but then we also look at the application moving forward. So we know today commercial communication satellites have electric propulsion on them. Uh, if we go to this 12 and a half kilowatt size, that can remove the liquid apogee motors that are used from some launch vehicles. That even helps the commercial satellite industry more. 
Um, so these things have application not only for NASA use, but also for, for use of the next generation of satellite technology. So I think we, we invest on a variety of activities, not knowing exactly where the outcome is, and we do it in a measured way that we can then get the best technology for future applications. Along that very point, uh, Dr. Chang Diaz, uh, Mr. Cassidy, Mr. Picotti, would you expand for a moment, besides the government interest, and we just talked about this to a degree, how would you quantify commercial interest in high-powered in-space propulsion systems, gentlemen? For, uh, <clears throat> for our company, uh, we started out actually as a purely private uh, venture, and it was all funded by private investors. And our interest was not really to go to Mars, because going to Mars is really not a good business right now. So. But it is important to build the this, this, this scaffolding that eventually will make it into a good business. And right now, the business of space is closer to Earth. And so our vision is more of the vision of the trucking business of space. You know, building uh, essentially um, a, a, a logistics capability, an electric, high power electric truck and we think of ourselves as sort of the, uh, the diesel engine of space that enables all these trucks to be traveling back and forth between the vicinity of Earth and the moon to make some revenue for the company and then as need, needs uh, expand, why we go further. So that's the vision. Thank you. Mr. Cassidy? I would just say uh, very similarly, um, We've been in the commercial side. We're, we're supplying hardware now to most of the commercial satellite providers uh, who fly electric propulsion. Um, what we do see, as Bill said, as we're working with NASA on these higher power devices, there are other functions on those spacecraft that can be accomplished, like changing them from the drop-off orbit where the launcher leaves them to their final destination. Then there's a whole world of expanding possibilities that we're seeing open up. Uh, people are talking about these large uh, 6,000 satellite low Earth orbit constellations. Those satellites have to go to individual points around the globe and be positioned. You can do that very effectively with a space tug. Um, and I like Franklin's term, the space truck. We, we think of it very similarly. Um, it's pretty, um, um, you know, multi-purpose. It, it really serves a lot of different functions. Um, we see interest in the DOD world because they're looking at uh, reducing the cost to get their assets where they need to be, um, and as well as improving the resiliency of the assets. And that all involves more maneuverability in space, which is, again, something that Solar Electric can provide to them. Um, and then finally, I would say, um, you know, there's going to be probably an expanding sphere of influence of the economy as we move out and do these exploration missions around the moon. We're going to start supporting people who want to go mine the moon and do things like that. They're going to need transportation systems as well. And so as we're moving out to Mars, they're going to be coming along behind us and doing things that are economically viable, and they'll need these transportation systems to support that. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I see my time's expired. Yes, sir. Uh, now the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Beyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And thank you for holding this hearing. It was yeah. just fascinating. Uh, Dr. Chang Diaz, you, you've been in space. And I was impressed with your opening paragraph where you said, in securing our ability to travel in deep space safely and sustainably, we're also ensuring the survival of our species. Can you expand on that? Are you worried about the survival of our species and how we're going into deep space? Well, that? this has been voiced by many of my colleague astronauts, and we all believe that you know we are all astronauts in this one planet that we have. It is the only one we have, and we have no redundancy. And astronauts like redundancy. You know that. You know that. <laughs> and so, in, if you look at uh, the way humanity is all housed in this, uh, you know, this one ball. Um, it is our life support that matters right, right now. We have no way, if something were to happen to us, something that uh, could be brought by some external, uh, beyond our control event, uh, we would be history that no one could tell. And um, it doesn't matter that much to the universe that whether we are here or not, but it does matter to us. And so I think the important th thing here is that for us to enable ourselves to be beyond and to work beyond and live beyond our uh, Earth is, is, is fundamental to our survival. Great. 
Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pancotti, uh, much of this testimony is, uh, the hearings is with the understanding that the asteroid redirect mission was canceled and that all the work that was done there basically, I mean, some of it moves forward. Um, I won't ask this of our NASA gentleman, but was it a mistake to cancel it and to defund it? Um, from, from my personal view, um, I don't think I don't think it is. Um, I like to use the term keep our eye on the prize, and that prize is Mars. I think um, the next step forward uh, for humanity, I think it's a, a, a huge calling, like uh, Dr. Chang Diaz mentioned, to get to Mars and put people on, on another planet. Um, and in doing so, uh, I think the most direct approach to that uh, is, is the best, best path forward. Um, as far as technology goes, um, propulsion devices that all three of us that are here are talking today, those propulsion devices were initiated under the ARM mission, and they are one of the most um, direct technologies that is going to move forward. No matter what we do in deep space, we are going to need advanced propulsion. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Dr. Walker, in, in your uh, both written and, and <clears throat> oral testimony you wrote, you said, <clears throat> for investments are required in electrical propulsion technology across the spectrum of expected time to return on investment. Is that just a really polite way of saying that they show no return on investment? Uh, or, no, it's not. Or, or not in our lifetimes. And, no, and, and is it reasonable to expect a reasonable return on investment when we're talking about the exploration of deep space? Sure, let me explain. Uh, I think the spectrum is very important. There are commercial things right now that impact our economy from how we deliver commercial satellites. That's a significant business. That business is up for grabs now as electric propulsion has become more mainstream. And the, next, the country or group that creates the next best electric propulsion device will own that business. So we need to make some very short-term investments so that we can make sure we have that. <clears throat> In the long term, as the power available on orbit continues to, can, continues to rise, then we can begin to feed in these higher power devices. So yes, it's a spectrum, some things that will be very impactful in the next five years, and other things we won't see for 15 to 20 years. Great. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yeah, thank you very much. Mr. Dr. Cassidy, Mr. Cassidy, um, you talked about how you're on a development path that results in SCP system capability in the 100 kilowatt to 200 kilowatt power range. And yet we heard, um, I guess, Dr. Chang Diaz's company that they're already doing a consistent 200 kilowatt. Um, are you lagging behind, or is it just because it's different technologies with different uses? Or, uh, yeah. you know, you, you, think, you seem uncompetitive right, relatively. Okay. So, yeah. so, so I guess what I was trying to focus on there was the total system power that we need to get to Mars in the 2030s. And my point was, we don't need to go to a megawatt to be ready to go to Mars. We can do it with 100 to 200 kilowatts. We've done a lot of internal studies on the architecture, as was shown in the in the diagram that I presented there. Um, and I know NASA, you know, our colleagues at NASA are doing the same thing. What we're trying to do, and I used the word incrementalism earlier, we're trying to come up with a um, walk before you run approach. I guess we know the budgets are tight. We know that we're going to have to work under a constrained budget environment for the foreseeable future. Um, and within that environment, we're trying to be responsible and say, what's the minimum amount that we need to uh, have to ensure we could do this mission and make the mission close? And for the cargo part of that mission, we can live with about 200 kilowatts, I agree. something in that range. That's for the total system. And then the idea is that we'd plug in these 12 and a half kilowatt thrusters that we're developing right now for STMD onto that vehicle and that would be the cargo vehicle that would fly uh, most of that payload that we talked about um, to Mars before the astronauts get there and pre-deploy pre it. Okay, great. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, now the gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this uh, hearing today and organized as it is so that we can have a better understanding of the goals and the technology needed to achieve those goals. And uh, I appreciate uh, the witnesses and I appreciate your leadership on this. Um, we had a hearing on materials and the development of new materials uh, and how that relates to human progress. Uh, we had that just yesterday or the day before. And uh, uh, when we're talking about the electric uh, propulsion systems now, which 
is being presented to us as some new type of uh, options that we have. Um, how much of this is dependent, was dependent on new materials? Is this a, uh, is this something that's part of this formula? Whoever wants to go right ahead. It was quite dependent on, on materials, advanced materials, uh, particularly when you deal with very hot plasmas. Mm -hmm. And um, you have to uh, encase these uh, plasmas in materials that will not uh, erode away or melt away. Uh, so there are some uh, special ceramics that have been developed uh, that enable us to shine these electromagnetic waves that make the plasma hot yet they go right through the, the, the walls of the, of the rocket. So the material uh, development has been, has been critical. For us, uh, some of the, um, the means of delivering this energy to the plasma um, requires materials in special antennas and special coatings that we use. Very, uh, very new um, materials, of course, that are proprietary right now, but, uh, but definitely materials is very important. The, uh, did the, any of these materials uh I have not been uh, a friend of necessarily spending more money on fusion energy. Uh, I felt that was something that it doesn't seem like we've made much progress. However, uh, I've been told that uh, fusion energy, uh, and then the actual our attempt to develop it, has helped produce new materials. Is this was that part? Is this part of that? In our case, it is, and I think in the case of Anthony's as well, I think we, we both have the same pedigree from the fusion energy uh, program way back in the, well, he's a lot younger, but I, you know, I'm, I go back, back to the 1970s when we were trying to develop fusion, and they told us it was 20 years away. And so, so well, it's, uh, you're I'm reminded early. of that uh, so. uh, expression where the young kid says, uh, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm on my way. And uh, I think with fusion energy, uh, uh, I've, as I say, I've been skeptical that we'll ever get to the point where we can use it for the production of electricity here, but uh, we can see that there's benefits that, that we don't know are going to happen. And uh, so I'm very pleased to hear that all that money that we spent on fusion energy <laughs> didn't go to waste. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Zurich about the uh, the choices here that we do have, and maybe it's like a choice between fission and fusion, I don't know, but uh, the idea of having a refueling station, a cryogenic uh, propellant storage station there, uh, is that uh, with this type of new technology that we're talking about developing and, and, and putting into place, uh, is it still important for us to do cryogenic storage facilities and refueling, basically refueling stations uh, why, if we have this capability. Yeah, um, as uh, Mr. Gerstermeyer mentioned, one of the real advantages of electric propulsion is the storability of the propellant. So for the 12 and a half kilowatt thruster system, xenon is the propellant and xenon is, is storable. And so we don't have to uh, come up with capability to uh, either passively or actively uh, cool the system to keep that propellant available to the thruster system. Um, however, if we look at more advanced chemical propulsion systems like LOX hydrogen propulsion systems for in space, then that would require advances in technology to bo for both long-term storage of LOX and particularly hydrogen. Uh, long-term uh, long storage of hydrogen is very challenging and to keep the boil off low and you'll need active cooling to be able to do that and then transfer technologies. Um, so that, that would be more geared towards if we went to higher performing in space chemical repulsion stages. The, the real advantage of electropulsion is the storability of the propellant and not needing to do, go to cryogenic propellants. I'm not sure if that was a yes or no, but uh, uh, do we see that if we're going to be having a successful, there's talk that maybe we should, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 you keep your eyes on the prize like you say. I'm, I'm not necessarily involved with trying to eliminate all these other options we need to do in space in order to just get to Mars, but in order to get do some of our moon, if, if we readjust so that it's moon first, then Mars, 
uh, will we need a cryogenic uh, storage facility as compared to a deep space uh, propellant like was being described today? Yeah, if we continue to go down the route of chemical propulsion, we, we talk about we talked about being able to produce a fuel with uh, water resources on the moon, and then being able to handle that propellant, store it, and transfer it would be a capability we want to need if we wanted to use that ISRQ capability uh, on the moon, um, as we as was mentioned previously. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, gentlemen, very much. It's been a very uh, educational experience. God bless. Thank you. Now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank all of you on the panel for a very informative session, all of you. Uh, Dr. Cheng Diaz, I was uh, particularly pleased that you mentioned survival of our species as an important aspect of our space missions. Uh, I don't think that's emphasized enough uh, for a number of years. I know any time any of us mentioned it, critics said you're trying to scare people into supporting space. And uh, a lot of those critics dropped off uh, a year or so ago in that relatively small, undetectable asteroid detonated over an uninhabited area of Russia, a thousand miles from the closest living person, and still injured over a thousand people, and, and made them reflect a little bit more about the cause of the last ice age, the cataclysmic asteroid that hit the Yucatan Peninsula. But anyway, thank you for mentioning that. I wish we would all be more informed about it and mention it more often. I think the public would have an interest in that. Uh, since there's no more shuttles for Bruce Willis to change the course of these things on, uh, we'd be in a bit of a bind. The longest silence I ever heard in this place is when I asked uh, uh, three of our top ranking space officials what would happen uh, if we found uh, a relatively small one, the size of the one that imploded over Russia, headed for the Big Apple? And we had three days, and we, and we never would have three days to do something about it. It's the longest silence I've ever heard in this committee. And, uh, but anyway, uh, having always been informed that there's no such thing as perpetual motion or a perpetual energy machine, I wonder if any of you would care to comment on the closest thing to it that you have ever seen. Well, in, in, in our case, uh, we deal with it every day, is uh, superconductivity. Uh, the magnet uh, that produces the strong magnetic field that uh, houses the plasma in the rocket is a superconducting magnet. And this magnet uh, runs electricity through its windings with almost uh, zero, absolute zero resistance. So in a sense, it's like this current can keep going forever. It's almost like a per perpetual motion machine. It is not. There is a tiny little bit right. of uh, resistance that you have to deal with, and that comes out uh, in the electric bill that you do have to pay to keep the, the magnet. It's just about 100 watts, but you do have to pay, pay for that. And this is technology that's already in the field, and you know, we see it in, in hospitals. Um, uh, MRI machines are basically superconductors, and we want to improve that technology to the high temperature superconductors, which are much cheaper, much more uh, uh, capable, so that we can have MRI machines in ambulances and perhaps in you know, field hospitals or, or clinics and something really uh, that can be done uh, th that way. So this is the way space feeds to our society. Uh, there's been some theories that uh, some other uh, folks may have harnessed, uh, isolated and focused uh, magnetism in a way that would propel uh, without sparks. What do you think about that? Well, I've seen uh, a lot of uh, fringe um, projects uh, that you know, you know, uh, promise to deliver um, tremendous results. But we all, we all, we are all scientists, and we all believe in the scientific uh, process that's in place. Uh, we're, we're scientists vet. These, uh, these things, and you have to do an experiment and, and measure and be able to prove to your peers that you are measuring the right thing, and after you're done that, then people believe you. But until you do that, uh, it's all just uh, smoke and Theory. mirrors. Theory. Sir, thank you. Uh, do any of you foresee uh, any 
advances or breakthroughs in battery storage capacity in the relatively near future? Yeah, I think uh, that's something we're working pretty actively right now. Uh, we just replaced the batteries on the space station uh, with lithium ion uh, yeah. upgrade from the nickel hydrogen batteries that were the you know primary technology available at the time we started putting the space station together. And so we have a group um, in our company that's always looking at the next uh, battery you know wave that's coming ahead of uh, where we are now. A lot of that's being driven by what you see across uh, multiple industries, including the automotive industry, um, laptop computers, and things like that. Um, but we're looking always uh, for what's the next energy efficient uh, without the problems of uh, some of the reactivity that you have in something like a lithium ion battery. Um, and there's a lot of applications for that that, that are driving that, including um, long-term undersea as well as space. So, yes, sir. Uh, I was going to ask you about a form of hydrogen, but I'm about out of time. And you no, sir. Have to I'm going to take the liberty of the chair and say we're going to ask some more questions. Go Great. ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Finish. Uh, you know, I understand there's, you know, all kind when we talk about hydrogen, uh, that, that, that there's all kinds of hydrogen. And, and you know, during World War II, uh, we were having some disasters with some of our Navy frogmen, I understand. They'd be down there welding up in a hole in a ship and their mask would explode. And, and it's my understanding that it was finally determined that the bubbles uh, from the welding that they're doing contain a hydrogen and uh, very uh, explosive and that was causing the, the problems with their mask. Don't know that's a fact, been informed that from several sources. So I, I saw a person one time uh, have a fish tank filled with water, a stream of carbon in the bottom of the tank, put a welding rod in there, it ignited the carbon and it continued to burn by itself and it made bubbles. And he had a, like a bell jar on top, and he, boom, the bubbles burst, and he captured the hydrogen in the bell jar and uh, pumped it into a compressor. He just used a, a like a, a diver's uh, air tank, sealed it up, hooked it up to a, a little engine, and started the engine, their engine ran off of it for about 10 minutes that I witnessed, could put my hand on the engine, could put my face on the exhaust pipe, it ran that cool, and, and uh, just like your thoughts on that. I mean, I perceived all kinds of things, you know, just from looking well, at that, and yeah. <laughs> all kinds of uses for it, and I'm just... Yeah, you, your, I think your description is, seems to me that it was uh, electrolysis, what was yes, happening yes, here, yes. and it was producing just, uh, it happens uh, that, uh, you know, the electricity in that uh, spark that you were seeing, or it was seeing, uh, was uh, breaking the water molecules right. into uh, oxygen and, and hydrogen, and so they... There must have been two streams of gas, one that he captured in the bell jar, which was the hydrogen, but there was also oxygen coming out. Um, and, and yes, uh, in fact, in our company, we're very deep in the hydrogen economy. In, in our, my home country of Costa Rica, we're trying to uh, deliver and produce hydrogen from water and solar and wind energy, electrical, electrically, to power uh, transportation, to, to power... Um, um, cars and, and mostly uh, urban buses and trains and so on. So, so it is very much um, uh, uh, here and now. So it's very yeah, important. The, the typical hydrogen that, that you might put in a balloon and the balloon would be flat the next day, you know. So we put some of this in a balloon and it was still just about fully uh, uh, blown up for, you know, over a month. And... Uh, you know, I just told maybe the buckyballs were different in there. They were thicker, bigger, and that would not have let him escape. But it just, I imagine by now, and this was <clears throat> 20 years ago, I thought now we'd be seeing that something like this in, in progress and, and making energy for it and running people's homes and 
over the road trucks. I'm just I'm just surprised. And and uh, anyway, I know my time's up now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. No, for sir. I think he, he's into racing cars, and I think he's trying to figure out some way to get an edge with hydrogen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I I did I did spend a day with Smokey Eunuch before he passed away, the the greatest automotive mine, I think in in American history. And Smokey's the one that said, man, you know, we, I mean, we talked about it a long time. He scratched his head, and he said, you know, it's, I mean, it's just hydrogen, but it's different than any other hydrogen I've ever dealt with here, you know. And so, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Posey. I, there were just a couple more questions that I, I wanted to ask as well um, of, of a couple of you. And, and Mr., uh, Dr. Walker, one, what are the largest technological challenges associated with the development of advanced in-space propulsion generally? What, what, are you, what are we dealing with here? What, what are we having to overcome? So the, the largest technological challenges is time. So what everyone alluded to here is, well, I need a lot of electricity so I can get my trip time down. What they're not saying is that that means those engines that we use have to last thousands of hours. So the engine has to be able to run for years. And so if there is some small little process that's slowly eating away at that engine, I have to have a great experiment to catch that process so I don't build it into my final product. So for us, we have to have really great facilities so we can catch the little slow progressing physics that will eventually kill the engine. And that, and, and you're talking, you're still talking about uh, electric propulsion and solar electric propulsion, right? That's correct. The slightest little flaw over a, over a period of years, and you you have a destroyed engine, and you're dead. You're dead in the water. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, I wanted to also ask uh, uh, Mr. Gerstenmeyer, extensibility is the concept that technologies developed in the near term. Uh, be useful for future exploration as well. Extensibility prevents the development of dead-end capabilities. How is NASA ensuring that its investments in in-space propulsion technologies are ex extensible? Again, what kind of what we're doing is we look at systems we put together. So when we talked about you know, the cislunar habitat or the Deep Space Gateway, if you described it, um, that uses 12 and a half kilowatt thruster technology. Um, we think a lot of the things we solve for that 12 and a half kilowatt thruster level can be then uh, advanced and moved forward through things similar to the nested technology that, um, um, that Joe talked about a little bit. And then you can advance that to the higher level thrust, maybe 50 kilowatt thrusters for the deep space transport. So that technology we do around the moon to allow us to maneuver the habitat to various locations that same technology then can be advanced and pieces of it moved forward. Um, we're also not only doing that, but then we're also investing in this brand new technology, the, the things that, that two of the panel members here are looking at. It's a different technology, but it has tremendous potential for us. So we want to invest in those on the ground to look at things like running them for 100 hours, and that was part of our, our test plan. And that was to look at this life issue that was described by the panel. So we think we can do that. We do that in parallel. Then if that comes online, then we can interject that technology into that next generation of spacecraft. So the idea is to, to look at what we're doing with each piece, look at the individual technology underneath it, the power uh, systems that have to convert from solar arrays and bring that power level to the thrusters, that same power conversion technology is common what, no matter what the thruster itself does. So that technology is common. So we look for those areas, those common threads across multiple technologies that can be expanded or extended into other areas. And we don't end up with a technology that only supports one type of spacecraft and has no apl applicability to other spacecraft. Uh, I appreciate that. How, we're talking about faster velocities. How much faster? I mean, we're, uh, if we're talking about um, uh, this type of propulsion, you know, and, and put it in terms that the, those of us who are laypersons can understand, how much faster are we talking about here? Any of you, if you'd like to chime in. So, so I mentioned the architecture studies that we're looking at. Um, we typically want to try to work on about a two-year cycle for Mars missions. As you know, uh, about every right. other year is a favorable opportunity to leave. Um, so what we do, when I mentioned that 100 to 200 kilowatt system power level, um, we are trying to time the launches of the cargo vehicles so that they will be there, have enough time to have that equipment in position 
before we launch the crew on the next opportunity. So there's sort of a natural cycle there of about two years. If we don't have enough power, if we, if we you know, for whatever reason, uh, the thruster technology isn't adequate or the power system technology doesn't give us the efficiency of the power transfer from the arrays to the thrusters, then we'd end up probably extending that by six months or a year. So then we're out of sync and we're not, we're not able to support the mission. So that's really the trade, the way we look at it. Um, it's, it's fitting the longer transit time that the solar electric's gonna take to the other mission constraints, like when we're gonna wanna launch the crew and get them there so that everything lines up. Okay, thank you. And then one last question from Mr. Jerzyk. Future in-space propulsion may require enormous amounts of power beyond what solar power can feasibly provide. What kinds of other power technology is NASA pursuing to meet increasing power demands in coming decades? Yeah, so right now we're focused on um, compact nuclear fission-based reactors, um, targeted for surface power uh, currently, but uh, we can evolve it to spacecraft power systems. So early next year, uh, in collaboration with DOE, we're going to demonstrate a one kilowatt fission-based reactor at the Nevada test site that scales to 10 kilowatts. Um, and, uh, and then the other key t technology uh, that's part of that is the conversion technology. So that's going to use Stirling cycle um, engine technology to convert the heat from the reactor to electrical power. There are other cycles that we need to look at too, but that's, um, that's going to be key to get the efficiency <coughs> up to convert the you know, the, the heat from the reactor to electrical power and, and continue to advance that conversion technology. Um, so we are working, current efforts are focused on surface power, but we're looking at how those uh, technologies and systems are extensible for higher, uh, for nuclear power for spacecraft. All right. Okay, how about you? Okay, Mr. Barrow. I'll take advantage. I feel like a student in office hours with, with the professors here. Um, so thinking about this with regards to solar electric propulsion, um, Mr. Cassidy, uh, the further you get away from the sun, does the amount you can generate diminish? Is that? Yes. Okay. Yes. So and, and Anthony referred to that in, in his remarks. Uh, right. So, you know, we're falling off, uh, it's roughly a, a factor of two out at Mars. Um, if you look at the history of deeper space exploration, um, with the exception recently of Juno, everything we've sent out further in the solar system has used some sort of either radioisotope or other uh, type of nuclear power. And uh, solar arrays are only going to be good probably for, you know, going between here and Mars. At that point, some point in the future, as we start to go further out, especially with human scale missions, we're going to need to have nuclear power developed. Right. And again, it's, it's appropriate. You know, part of the reason why we can use nuclear when we're going further out is we don't have human beings, and you know, the, obviously the exposure factor is, is, is different. It's also accurate to think then, you know, so for us in, in the public, we see big launches, and you see the big thrusts and so forth. That really is to break the gravity well. Um, once you're beyond the gravity well of Earth, and you're in the vacuum of space, and I don't know if, uh, you know, I, I think of space as a vacuum, but I don't know if it's a, a true vacuum. As you're accelerating, though, you're gonna continue to accelerate. Is that not, are we thinking about that correctly? So, Dr. Pat. Yeah, that's correct. So uh, part of what I was talking about, um, we're dominated by orbital mechanics, right? So with chemical systems, what I called um, in, in my initial argument was, um, kind of a impulse and coast, and that's what we do with chemical systems. We, we apply a force, and then we coast for a very long time, so all of the orbits line up, and we can get to our destination as efficiently as possible, because with chemical systems with low ISP, they're not efficient, and we have to do that in order to, to rendezvous and make that uh, approach. Um, when I was talking about going to very high power and very high ISPs, we can talk about doing direct burns. Uh, where we turn the thruster on and we leave it on and we just pick our target, we aim directly towards it and we go straight for it. Um, in order to do that in a short time, you need a large power, megawatts worth of power, the nuclear reactor type powers. So you can, if you're continually thrusting and, and, and burning, you can cut the time down. That, 
Yeah, so. in fact, sometimes you can even eliminate the need to do a flyby, which is sort of another lap around right. the sun. And so, for some missions, there's a lot of missions right now in the, in the New Frontiers proposals that are out there that are looking at solar electric for that reason, uh, just because the science return, the time frame that they can get it back in uh, is reduced uh, dramatically for, for these principal investigators. Dawn is another good example uh, that was brought up earlier. Um, the ability to um, you know, directly fly, orbit one body in the asteroid belt, and then depart and go to another body, that's unprecedented. We've never been able to do that. And Dawn, actually, I believe I read this right, uh, or my friend John Brophy at JPL was telling me um, the total amount of, of impulse that Dawn provided to the spacecraft, the ion engines provided to the spacecraft, was greater than the Delta II rocket that launched it out of the gravity well. So that's just to give you some idea, and it was done with just a couple hundred kilograms of xenon that was on board the spacecraft. We, um, so we've spent a lot of time talking about acceleration and so forth, but we also then have to think about deceleration, right? And do, um, do you have to use propellant to decelerate or do you, through science, use the natural gravity and atmosphere? I don't, so. Yeah, missions now use uh, propellant to decelerate to say achieve uh, Martian orbit. Um, there are other uh, approaches that we've studied like aero capture. Um, so you can dip down into the Martian atmosphere and use atmospheric drag to decelerate and then come back out and achieve, achieve Martian orbit. So there are, there are other approaches that, that do not uh, you know, uh, need propellant. But we haven't, we haven't tried any of those yet. Um, and uh, I'd, be, I'd be really uh, looking forward to a mission that would be willing to sign up for aero, you know, aero capture. Uh, we do aero braking right now where we go into Mars orbit in a high elliptic orbit and then dip down in the atmosphere to uh, slow down and circularize the orbit, but we haven't done aero capture yet. Okay. And then I guess my last question, one that, that I hadn't necessarily thought about. We've talked about what powers the engine, um, but the propellant, the gasoline in, in that engine. And just, again, listening to the, the conversation, different propellants require um, different um, size uh, gas tanks, in, in essence. And, and right now, it, are, are we also doing research on smaller propellants as well? And, and that, that, or? So, so yeah, so there's a number of sort of lower uh, technology readiness level uh, things out there that people are looking at. Um, especially now, I mentioned the constellations of satellites earlier. A lot of those constellations want to fly electric propulsion on board a very small spacecraft, you know, maybe, um, something that would sit on this table in front of me here. Um, and for them, um, xenon, it, while it's good, it has some of the problems that you brought up. It needs a big you know, tank of some sort. Um, and they're looking at things that might be able to fly with a solid propellant, for instance, something like iodine, and then let that propellant just sublime off into a gas and be run through the engine. So there are some programs like that I know that are out there people are looking at. Just to add, we have several public-private partnerships within STMD, um, not only within the pro our programs, but also SBIR, to advance these very highly efficient, very compact electric propulsion systems for you know, CubeSats and small spacecraft. And that's, that's come along pretty well. Um, iodine, solid iodine is definitely one of the repellents that you can get, pack, get, get the uh, energy you need in a very small package. Great. Thank you. That's Thank you, Mr. Barron. Uh, Mr. Posey has uh, some additional questions. Uh, just since we have the extra time, Mr. Chairman, if nobody minds, uh, 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 as you know, we're still waiting on a uh, map to Mars, you know, on a road map, to kind of put everything in perspective. And so there's, like, there's questions uh, we had the uh, pleasure of um, asking today and learning the answers to today that, uh, or maybe even ahead of, a little bit ahead of the edge, but. We talk about the, the, the craft and the engines to, to take us to Mars, and we talk about the durability of them that's required, which is you know, a serious issue. And, and I assume that we would use the craft and the engines continuously as much as possible. Once we would get them in orbit, we just have cyclers. We just eventually have a supply train up there. Maybe we go back and forth to the moon. I think Buzz Aldrin talked about it in his cyclers. You know, we ought to be able to get fuel on the moon to go back and forth, and 
refuel the cyclers and you know have stuff going all the time where you wouldn't have to wait if you were on Mars you wouldn't have to wait two years to come home again for the right you know we'd have something going through there all the time uh, thoughts about that yeah I can comment um, I think what you're talking about is is a truly sustained architecture those, those are the words we use a lot uh, a sustainable uh, deep, deep space architecture um, what we're talking about today is building <clears throat> the foundations to make that possible yeah. um, with with advanced power uh, and in particular, uh, high ISP, which electric propulsion devices can do, you can start talking about building those infrastructures in space where you do have a, a continuous supply of materials. Okay. Well, I think the NASA guys, thank you for answering that. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Is that it? Okay. Um, this has been a very fascinating hearing, uh, one of, the, one of the, the best ones that I believe I've had since I've been in Congress. So uh, I'd like to thank the, um, the witnesses for being here and answering your, these, these questions. Um, and I really, really appreciate uh, your expertise and your fields. And uh, without any further ado, I would like, and let's see, I, I wanna thank, where is my memo here? <laughs> I got lost, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, we're going to have this thing opened up for a while to, to take our uh, any any further questions or uh, if any of the other members would, who were not able to be here, if they want to ask further questions, they certainly can. It will remain open for two weeks for additional comments uh, from our members. So without any further ado, I adjourn this, this hearing. Thank you.